Good evening. good evening. Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. It's so good to see you. I was worried I wasn't going to see you today. It's just one of those days. There's an earthquake in Newark Airport. I got out of Newark just in time. I get here, and then there's a, I get T-boned by another car. And anyways, it's just one of those things. You're just like, am I going to make it, Jennifer, you know? And, uh, you know, the Lord must want us to be here. And the important thing is to actually get here safely and uh, nobody got hurt. So praise the Lord for that. And, uh, but it does remind us of the fragility of life. And so we're thankful for God's uh, protection over uh, each and every one of us that we can be here and worship together in sacred spaces such as this one. Let's bow our heads together and pray before we dive in into some of our Adventist past. Father God, I just pray that you would bless our time together as we explore some of the stories, some of the stories of how you have led, including here in this very surroundings. We are on, on sacred ground, sacred because you have worked in and through those people in the past or pioneers and you also want to work in our lives so bless us as we reflect and remember those stories in Jesus name amen entitled my talk this evening uh, the paradox of Adventist activism what does this mean uh, to be activists as we're looking through uh, the, the the stories of our pioneers and one of the things that keeps continually coming through to me is that our pioneers did not just lackadaisically sit by on the sidelines and see what happens around them, that they were active and engaged and involved in their world, but for a variety of reasons. And it's, it's a little bit uncanny that I'm going to begin with this here this evening. But, uh, you know, one of the things that really woke up our pioneers, if you look through, and this is what I like to do for fun, I, I dig in the archives, all right? So archive statistics and research nobody knows what that is I heard my kids talking to their friends they're like what's your dad do and they're like well I have no idea but my dad tells stories so so there you go and uh, so this evening we're gonna talk about some stories about how uh, from from our past uh, but the story I want to begin with is the signs in the heavens and and so just the last like two weeks I, I decided to do like this 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 hard run through the Millerite periodicals the signs of the times the midnight cry these old brittle pages and just turning through them page by page and so what I'm going to share with you this evening is some of the things that have been just kind of oozing and dripping uh, from doing this fresh take through uh, what historians we like to call them primary sources okay through the those original documents and finding some of these things that I had never seen before but but the thing that just kind of really pops out at you just having done this fresh read through all of this stuff is how much there they're talking about the environment, things that are going on in their world around them, signs in the heavens. And there's even poems. I found this one of the, of the dark day, you know, and the, frequently quoting Joel, too, you know, that, that there's going to be wonders in the heavens. And so all the different things about earthquakes and, and, of course, they knew the Lisbon earthquake. This is an artist's depiction of the Lisbon earthquake, the uh, absolutely... Uh, catastrophic uh, destruction across the across the European seaboard through the Mediterranean people knew that and of course Lisbon where there's even an earthquake museum if you go there you can see uh, just the utter devastation that occurred you had the the famous or the infamous dark day and, and this seems only apropos because on Monday we have this lunar eclipse coming on and 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 you know what's crazy? This week I'm reading through 1843 and there is a lunar eclipse. And they're saying this has got to be a sign in the heavens. We should pay attention. The Bible talks about these kinds of things and how the cattle were coming in in the middle of the day. Uh, the falling of the stars, you know, the Leonid meteor shower and, and how this was particularly uh, impactful. I love to find these these stories of, of people with memory statements. This is what I remember. I remember seeing this in almost every single account that I have found. They say it led them to ask questions about the Bible. Wait, wait, doesn't the Bible have something to say about this? Shouldn't we be studying the Bible? And, 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 and I've kind of... 
haven't had as much time to review just because of everything being kind of crazy today. Uh, so I don't remember all the accounts. I, I put a couple of them in here, so I hopefully will remember which ones. Here's one by Edwin West that I found, okay? The stars descended like a rain of fire. How, do, how would you like that? You saw that. Uh, and, and, and just a rain of fire. Here, here's another one. This is a, a young man by the name of Hiram Guilford. He will be just a boy when this happens, but it will leave an indelible mark through the rest of his life that he will then remember this experience and it would lead to his conversion. And, and he said that many appeared frightened. The shooting stars had the appearance of raining fire again here. And then I think this is the one where he's on a, one of these, well, they called him a packet boat on the, on the uh, Erie Canal where he travel along. He said that, that, that some people were trying to hide and, and then he goes to his mother and they start opening their Bible and, and start studying the Bible with people on board that little boat as they're just traveling along the Erie Canal. And, and, and he says, my mother at the time believed the occurrence to be a sign of the end of the world and the coming of Christ, as did also my father. He will become a Millerite and later a Seventh-day Adventist preacher because of the signs in the heavens that, that he sees around him. And by the way, it's not just here in America. It's literally people all around the world who are waking, awakening to the fact, to this news through the Bible, through studying the Bible, that Jesus must be coming again, that Bible prophecy is being fulfilled. And, and I just, I, I have so much fun with this. Uh, Joseph Wolf is just one example. Uh, he was over in, in uh, Europe, grew up in a Jewish family, would convert by meeting with his, working with his neighbor who was a Christian. He'd get up at five o'clock in the morning milking the cows with the neighbor. The neighbor used that as an opportunity to befriend the young, this young man and, and that friendship would grow and they would have studies from the Bible, from the Old Testament. And he said, you know, eventually Isaiah 53, it, he, was, he was converted and would decide that he wants to go be a missionary, share with others the good news about Jesus and his soon return. He was a little bit, uh, 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 impetuous individual because they said, you know, if you want to be a missionary, you need to go to the Vatican. You need to go to go to Rome. And so he goes to Rome and he's studying in class. This, this is the kind of person he was. He says, well, you know, I, I like almost everything except for I can't find any evidence in the Bible for papal infallibility. And he, and he said, well, don't talk about that. Don't talk about that. He, he kept raising his hand, you know, and, and asking these questions, uncomfortable questions. And, and, and one day in the back of class, there was a, a, a man that was, that was visiting, and, and he hears this precocious young person uh, asking all these questions, and finally waits to the end of class and says, if you ever need something, uh, here is my business card. His name was Henry Drummond. And, and sure enough, the, within the next week, he got kicked out of school. The armed escort, they said, we don't ask questions about the authority of the Pope here. And so he thought, well, I got this business card. Maybe that's a sign from the Lord. And so he goes to London, finds Henry Drummond, and it's a long story, but, but he helps to finance him. He will go across North Africa through the Middle East. They try to kill him. They put him on... Um, they put him on a, they, they think he's, he's unconscious. They think he's dead. They throw him out on the trash heap. He wakes up the next day and, and, and just dusts off his feet. Says, That's what Jesus said to do. Goes to the next village talking about Jesus and proclaiming the good news of his return. If you ever want something fun on a Sabbath, rainy Sabbath afternoon, you're just absolutely bored and need something to do, or maybe especially for your kids, and, and thanks to digitization, okay? Just you, Travels and Adventures of Joseph Wolf. Check it out. You will not be sorry. Just it will keep you on the edge of your seat of him going across a a, a swinging bridge on the back of an elephant, okay? Or, or trying to escape 
uh, 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 thugs that are trying to kill him and, and he jumps out in the front of the caravan and he'd just been through a plague infested region and says the plague, the plague and then he writes how his life had been saved by a pandemic. So just story after story, it's, it's just absolutely uh, phenomenal. Uh, independent of Joseph Wolf was another uh, a Jesuit priest actually by the name of Manuel Lacunza in, uh, in, in Argentina and in Chile. Uh, where he will also come to the same conclusion. Jesus must be coming. Look at the signs in the heavens. He's studying the Bible and Bible prophecy. It's pointing to the same thing, that, that, that the good news of Jesus and his soon return. In fact, he writes under a pseudonym because he's afraid. What, what are people going to think if I write about this? And, and contraband volumes of Manuel Lacunza's writings in Spanish will, will percolate all up and down uh, South America through Central America. It's, it's really quite uh, remarkable and copies will eventually percolate into North America. In fact, Ellen White will have a copy of his volumes in, in her library, was familiar with his work. But you just see the signs in the heavens just waking people up to the uh, attention and grabbing the attention of people. Jesus is coming soon. Get ready, get ready. And of course, here in America, we know the story of, of William Miller, a farmer turned preacher, uh, Adventist Heritage Ministry, which has this beautiful historic Adventist village, also has that, that home there in, in, in eastern New York where you can go and sit and see his study, that, that farmhouse where, where uh, uh, he was able to wrestle with God. And this is kind of interesting. So we're thinking about religious liberty here this weekend, right? We're thinking about religious liberty, and one of the, the key concepts of Adventism that I see coming back again and again is that people have a wrong view of God. And that view begins to radically change from a God that is a capricious God to one that is a loving God who gives people freedom. Freedom to choose for themselves, to see for themselves, to struggle and wrestle and, 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 and not to have other people tell them what to believe, but to search the Bible uh, as, as truth for, you know, as hid treasures to, to be sought after. And, and so Miller will do that. And, and he has this long conversion story, as many others do in our, in our pioneers. But the important point that, that I keep coming back to is he's falling in love with Jesus. Falling in love with Jesus. That's at the heart of religious liberty is knowing who Jesus is. If you know Jesus and love Jesus, you're not going to be having to feel like you have to force others to. You just want other people to invite other people to come to know and love Jesus too. Now, I found this just this week. I'm working on this encyclopedia article of, of William Miller, so, so I'm trying to, I'm doing this deep dive, which I've been telling you about, trying to read through all of William Miller's writings. I mean, every last slew, the whole thing, okay, from beginning to end, and so I'm in the middle of this, and so th this is what we do. We, we try to go back, find the stuff, and, and so what happens, you find sometimes some things you never knew before, okay, and, and you start reading these accounts of of, of, by Miller, where he's trying to go out and, and share his heartfelt conviction, his love for Jesus and his soon return. By the way, the, we're talking about the paradox, but here's one of the things you've got to catch because, and I love to tell my students this, because it doesn't make any sense to be an Adventist if you don't know and love Jesus. It's not like when I go away on a trip, you know, I'm, I'm just on this quick trip, but, but, you know, when I sometimes have to be gone on a longer trip and, and then, you know, especially when my kids are, were, were younger, you know, now they're teenagers driving and stuff like that. But Tina knows about that, you know, they're getting older and, but, but uh, our daughters are in school together. And, 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 and so uh, the William Miller uh, just, I mean, they would, when I would come home from a trip, they, they would just be, yeah, daddy's home, yes, daddy's home. And, and, and I was always trying to bring a present for them, you know? And that's what it means to be an Adventist, is to be so in love with Jesus, that when we are talking about Jesus coming again, it's so winsome, it's somebody so special, important to us, that, that we want to be both ready and to have other people want to meet him too. 
And that's, that's what it is. And so this is what I just found uh, this week. And, and he's writing about one of his missionary ventures as he's traveling out. He'll go for sometimes months at a time on these journeys. Uh, and, 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 and we like to tell the happy stories sometimes. We don't always tell the unhappy stories where, where some of Miller and some of these others would get tarred and feathered and, and sometimes even persecuted. But we kind of just keep on going like the Energizer Bunny. He says, I was much cast down in spirit, he's coming to this town, when, when I found no place open for us except an upper room in an attic. He's going to all the churches around. He says, hey, I, I, he had actually been invited. And they closed the doors. No, Miller, you're too dangerous. We can't let you preach here. So he goes up into an attic and, and check this out. He says, my lungs were very much affected by a reason of a cold I'd taken uh, the week before, yet after committing my case to God and praying for divine direction, I attempted to speak to a crowded house. Remember, they're in the attic. They're in the attic. Almost suffocated with the intense heat and bad air on, uh, on the duty of, and, and then check this out, of comforting, comforting one another on the subject of Christ second coming and then this is the thing I, the, the kicker that really just hit home to me this week and said many lovers of christ were there many lovers of christ were there and 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 once i read that and i i, I keep reading through like all this this the these millerite writings you know and 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 so um that phrase of lovers of christ or many lovers of christ that phrase keeps popping up again and again, we had this beautiful church service with the lovers of Christ. And, and this is why it's important to go back to these original sources. You start having these things pop out at you. And, and they talk about, and this is the activist part, because if you are in love with Jesus, you can't help but want to share Jesus with others. This is a natural um, it's it just a natural outgrowth. And so this is very, having PowerPoint with the projector and whatever you call this thing here is very Adventist. It's very Adventist. Going back to the pioneers, you know, you have this law chart here. You would have had a prophecy chart on, and, and you would have had stuff all around the room. And you read lots of these different accounts, and there were all kinds of visual uh, depictions. In fact, they kind of, some of these pioneers got carried away. They started making paper mache uh, versions of these different images, right? And if you go to the Center for Adventist Research, some of you are smiling. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, one pastor got carried away, started making these things and having them drop down, okay, in the middle of his meetings. And, and what do you do if you're an early pioneer? You, you tattletale to Ellen White. <laughs> you tattletale to Ellen White. Can you believe there's a pastor that's doing this. And we have that letter. We have that letter. And Ellen White writes the letter back. Now I'm using the Campbell paraphrase of Ellen White. And, 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 and my paraphrase of her letter back is leave him alone. He's doing a good work. Don't stop him. So it's that kind of creativity that's unleashed. All hands on deck. We need everything to be able to share the news of Jesus and his return. And then here is the, you have the counter strike. You have the counter strike. Here are people making fun. This is actually, now I can document this. When this was released, it was in Albany, New York, and William Miller really got bugged by this. This really just annoyed him uh, because he's, you know, he's, he and Himes and others are right. Can you believe what they're doing now? And then at the end of that, they write, but you know what? Maybe it'll be for the good of the gospel. Even the more they persecute us and make fun of us, it will be to the glory of God. Stand firm in our conviction. Stand firm in our faith. And so they're being ridiculed. And uh, it's amazing. This, I, I found this this week too, okay? I mean, this is the fun and joy of, of, of being a historian. You feel like you're Indiana Jones in the, in the archives. And, and I just found this book. Uh, and, and it's titled My Angel Storybook. In fact, I, I don't even remember the author's name. You can look it up. Uh, but but this, this guy is not a Seventh-day Adventist, okay? But he had memories of growing up during the heyday of the Millerite movement. 
and, and so he had these memories of angel stories. And one of the stories, and he tells it in this book, is the story of William Miller after one of these meetings, these hooligans come to the meeting house and they're throwing stones and they're attacking the Advent believers, okay? And, and so they're kind of getting a little bit threatened and scared. I mean, if people are throwing stuff at you and trying to disrupt your meeting and, and, and a, a crowd is formed and shouting and angry, and, 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 and he shares the story in this book, how in the middle of that, that Miller went ahead and, and said, you know, I'm not gonna be ashamed of, of my God. And he boldly walks out the back of the meeting house and down the street, and he said that as he walked out, there were two men who held back the crowd. <laughs> to the end of his life, he, said, he writes about the story. He believed that was an angel, God's divine providence protecting. And then when Miller got to where he needed to go, the, he, as he said it, I'm, I'm not saying it's what the author of this book says, the, those, those mysterious young men who had held back the crowd just suddenly disappeared. God's providential leading. And then you start finding these other little uh, names that start popping out of the woodwork and these periodicals as you're reading them, right? And, and one of them is this young preacher from Maine by the name of James White. Now, I've read Gerald Wheeler's biography. I've read a lot of Adventist history now. I've never seen anybody cite this reference before, okay? So this may, maybe someone has, and I just don't know it, but I, I think this might be uh, James White spotted in the wild in the archives, okay? And, and so here we go. Here is this report from Gardner, Maine. The following is a letter. It's summarizing this letter from, from James White, 1843. He's talking about how he left Palmyra, lectured in different places, Sydney, Augusta, Gardner, and so on. I, I find no opposition. Uh, most of the preachers are silent on the subject of Christ's immediate coming. Some of them tell the people they are willing to wait for time to decide the question. And then he says this, brethren, we cannot wait. God forbid that I should fold my arms and lazy lock while sinners are sinking to eternal night. I want you to notice something. Not only is Adventism activists, but there's a sense of urgency. Activism and urgency go together because people realize that eternal salvation of people is at stake. And so I, I found this uh, pamphlet by John Starkweather. Uh, he was one of these Oberlin preachers uh, influenced by Charles Finney. In fact, he would go around preaching with this famous revivalist, Charles Finney, bringing it, holding these large revivals and, and, and very interesting. He talks about his experience. He picked up a copy of William Miller's lectures and was reading through them. And, and, and as he's reading it, it leads him to an existential crisis because he realizes something. He didn't actually know how to study his Bible, and he dared to say that he had been a pastor and didn't know Jesus. And through reading those lectures, he had been confronted, he had been confronted um, with his own spiritual state and, and, and that he needed to change. And he will become an Adventist, but, but here's something in his autobiographical, this narrative account, this is... Uh, this is one of those, those documents that, that I had not seen before. I've been looking, trying to find, and had finally just found it uh, this week. And he writes about this, and I, I want you to notice, uh, this is coming to the, the, my title here tonight, The Paradox of Adventist Activism here. He's, he wrote this, and this is talking about a self-reflection of his prejudice towards Millerism. He said, I had before been very confident that all religious experience and religious action which should result from the belief of this doctrine. What's this doctrine? The doctrine of Christ's second advent here, okay? But Christ's soon return. So, must be selfish in its character and therefore spurious. What does he mean? Well, let me fill you in just a little bit in the context here. It must be selfish. When he, before his conversion experience, he looked on and said, well, if the world's going to burn, let's watch it burn. As long as I am safe. So why should we do anything? But when he has his conversion experience, and this leads to the paradox of Adventist activism, is when you fall in love with Jesus, you don't stand on the sidelines and watch everything fall apart. You do something about it. You have to do something 
about it. That's this activism. And so when his heart is converted, he truly falls in love with Jesus and the, the message of his soon return, it leads him. He realizes that assumption. By the way, people still wonder that today. They're like, oh, you Adventists, you must not care what's going on in the world around you. So therefore, you must be insulated and only concerned about yourselves, this kind of spiritual navel gazing. But what I can tell you from Adventist history, from our pioneers, is that they cared deeply about the world around them. They were activists to the core. They wanted to change the world because if they believed Jesus is coming and they were headed to the heavenly city, they needed to start right now working for a little bit of heaven on earth. A little bit of heaven on earth. And so they began and continued to share their faith. This is the, the Millerite Great Tent. So Kevin, who I think is going to be here tomorrow. I don't know if he's here this evening, but um, Kevin and I are good friends. And so we like to have a little historiographical rivalry once in a while. Okay, a little bit of debate going on. So there's a debate among historians. What was the largest tent in the 19th century uh, and so we had this kind of thing back and forth. How could we figure this out? Because the Millerites claim we, the, the Adventist tradition, we had the largest tent. The Oberlinites, the, they claimed with Charles Finney that he had the largest tent. Okay, so we were dueling in the archives. And I, I want you to know, I want you to know, after great and lengthy uh, archival sleuthing, Indiana Joe's deep diving into those records, I can assure you that, that the Millerite tent was about five feet longer. Yeah, yeah, amen, right? Yeah, so, so this good news, we can historically document that claim is, is verifiable. We can take claim to that and, and be proud of that fact, okay? And, and then here is William Miller's first chart. Now we talk about the, you know, the audio visual and the charts. This was the very first Millerite chart. William Miller himself designed it. I was able to, to actually figure out and decipher from the different extant charts in the archives. Now, now here's where we start getting to the activism part, because, because if you believe Jesus is coming, you have to do something, a little bit of, of heaven here on earth, then you need to start being involved in various reform societies. Now, I didn't make these names up. Don't shoot the messenger here. I just, I'm sharing with you what I found in the archives with the, the reference source. You can look it up for yourself. But, but look at all the reform societies going on. And this was just one week. I could, I could add dozens of other examples, but I just, one case study, the Prison Discipline Society, the Bible Society, the Peace Society, the Siemens Friends Society, the Boston Auxiliary Educational Society, any educators here, the Missionary Society, another Prison Society, uh, the Pastoral Society, the Missionary Society, another Missionary Society. Anyways, you have all these different societies that are focused on reaching others for Jesus, because if we believe he's coming, we need to start working for reform here on earth. And, and I know that, that my, my friend uh, uh, Kevin Burton, Dr. Burton, is going to be sharing with you about abolitionism. So, so in deference to my dear friend and colleague, I'm going to let him share about the abolitionist uh, story because that's so fresh. Uh, that, that you guys, I, I hope you realize, like Adventist historians have been after uh, Dr. Burton, you know, share your research, share your research, because he's in the, the deep throes of a doctoral dissertation. So you guys are going to get some uh, sneak preview of some, I'm, I'm, you know, this is amazing. You'd have no idea. And, and, uh, but I'm going to share some of the others, okay? I'll leave the abolition for, for, for him tomorrow, but some of the others, okay? But, but the abolition story is amazing. Um, and, and then I've been looking for, when did Adventists start doing missionary work for the native peoples? There were Millerites going out to the Native American tribes. Did you know that? Here, here is in the, uh, uh, the, the signs of the times where early convert became a Millerite preacher and he's going out uh, and, and taking publications and going out to the native peoples. No one's ever written about this before because no one's ever taken the time to look and find it. But this is incredible. And then, check this out. They are looking at saying, you know, we need to tell the world. Now, they had heard about Manuel Acunza and Joseph Wolf because they write about, hey, we found some copies of the writings. This is really incredible. But we need to make sure to send some of those materials on ships around the world because we don't have enough time to go everywhere. Let's at least get as many. And they printed millions of copies of these, of these different pamphlets and start sending them. Now, here's some of the cities. And I just found this on a, a random page where they were excited. They're sending off 
boxes and sh shipments of these, of these pamphlets, Millerite literature, going to Calcutta. That's India, to Madras, Bombay, uh, Ceylon, Burma, Siam, uh, or my, I have no idea where that is, Persia, Jerusalem, and check this out, the Sandwich Islands and Oregon, <laughs> the ends of the earth, <laughs> the ends of the earth. Now, I wanna tell you about the Sandwich Islands because that's my favorite place to do research. It's Hawaii. Who doesn't want to go to Hawaii? Amen. You know, I, I try to convince people I'm going to do a research trip to Hawaii. Yeah, right you are. But, but it makes my wife so happy. She goes and snorkels and I go sit in the archives and we're both happy and, and, it, and it works and it works. And, and so I actually, no one has ever written this before. I've written an academic journal article for the, for the uh, Journal of Hawaiian History. Check this out. On the history of Millerites in the Sandwich Islands, Hawaii. And what happened is that box of literature took root in those Hawaiian islands. And we can actually start tracing that. There was a great revival across the Hawaiian islands in the 1840s with people looking for and sharing with others about Jesus and his soon return. And we know, we don't know what happened to them, but we know there were people from Hawaii that then sent missionaries to other islands across the Pacific. I wish we knew all of those stories. Some of those stories we will only learn about in the heavenly archives. But we know that something happened. We know, at least we can document, that that bundle of literature all the way in 1843 bore fruit. And there were still yet others, like Joseph Bates. He's writing about, now he's a ship captain, right? And he, he writes about a, a, uh, some, uh, uh, some Millerite literature that goes to New Amsterdam. New Amsterdam, I saw it this morning at sunrise. New York City. And there were some ships, and, and they're fighting over the Millerite literature. I want it. No, no, I, I'm going to take it. And who's going to actually take it, you know? And, and who actually owns the literature? And he, Joseph Bates is writing about how wonderful this is at the height of the Millerite awakening uh, because Adventist activism, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't hold back. It doesn't hold back. It's all hands on deck. And by the way, Joseph Bates will be also famous because... He will become involved in a number of abolitionist societies. I hope, I'm sure Dr. Byrne will talk about that tomorrow, as well as one of the earliest temperance societies in America. He will be one of those leaders in organizing that work. And so that, that kind of work. Now, I say all hands on deck. That means that not only in terms of, of, of race, you know, abolition, the freedom of the slaves and equality, but also the importance of engaging women. When I deal with American religious history with people, with scholars outside of our faith, outside of our tradition, one of the things that, that stands out very noticeably and very quickly is how involved women were in the early beginnings of the Millerite, of the Advent movement. And, and this, is, uh, this is actually an artist's picture of Abigail Mussey, who was one of those women. We know there were more. Uh, Emily Clemens is one I just wrote a lengthy encyclopedia article on the last couple of weeks, um, just unpacking her contributions. Sometimes, and I, I know this, you know, just hold on to your seats, Ben, but sometimes the women were better preachers than the men. And, and you're not going to believe this. Sometimes the women baptize more people than the men. It, it's unbelievable. And, and so, in fact, they had their own publication called the Advent Messenger or the, the Advent Message to the Daughters of Zion. Encourage and empower women to go and share. If, if Jesus is coming, we, we can't hold back. And, and so people were kind of impressed, you know, the novelty of, of women preaching. But yes, we, we need all the help that we can get. And so uh, Adventism takes no quarters. Uh, Adventist activists includes everyone. And uh, that egalitarian emphasis is just so. And in fact, some people kind of question things. You know, don't worry about it. Jesus is coming. We'll figure it out when we talk to Jesus. But don't stop when the Holy Spirit is working. Don't stop anyone from telling others. Now, I wonder, 
this activist heritage that we have, if our pioneer, the, the earliest beginnings of our church that would begin to, to catch fruit and, 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 and that sense of mission of sharing Jesus would, would be contagious and it would be a very much a part of our Adventist identity that would continue to grow and expand um, to the global church that we have. Now I'm kind of fast forwarding from the Millerite movement on, but, but I'm so thankful for that legacy that we have that our pioneers took and, and were willing to, to take risk and to do whatever it could. I wonder sometimes, I wonder sometimes. Now I'm working on another project at the moment and that is I'm working on a devotional, 365 mission stories. So I'm kind of going crazy with Adventist mission stories. So I wanted to give you a tantalizing peek at a couple of my favorite stories that I've been doing research on because I wonder those activist roots of our pioneers if they could have ever imagined as time would continue on as the mission and the message would expand if they could imagine all the places that second, that beautiful second Advent message would go. And a couple of just tantalizing, and these are stories you probably are familiar with, but and I don't know what you like to do before you go to bed, but for me, I like to look at old archival pictures that are unidentified. That's, that's what I do for fun, okay? I, I, you know, I can't, you know, I can't help it, and, and we all have our vices, but, and, and so I was looking through some old glass lantern slides, okay, and, and a lot of them were unidentified, and, and I'm looking at them, do I recognize anybody in these pictures, and this one glass lantern slide jumped out at me, and I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, that's Fernando Stahl, the Advent message going all the way to South America, to the to the, to the highlands of the, of the mountains there, all the way up to Lake Titicaca, the largest freshwater lake in the world. And, and, and Fernando and his wife, Anna, uh, here's a picture, again, another one of these slides that was unidentified, so cool. This is a colorized actual picture uh, from the early beginnings of their days as missionaries down in, in Peru around Lake Titicaca. Uh, you can see she's holding a little baby. Fernando stalls with that little crazy tie there. Uh, there they are with all of these people and they just learn to love them. It, it, it seemed to be against all odds. They actually came here to Battle Creek to the sanitarium where they took nurses training. And then they, they went to Ohio. They started a lucrative practice where they were actually bought their own house and they were doing very well. And God, through the Holy Spirit, was not letting them rest. And they felt that conviction and they wrote to Ellen White, they wrote to church leaders, said, we are called to go be missionaries. Where can we go? We'll go anywhere in the world. We'll go to the hardest place in the world. And church leaders said, we don't have any money. They said, that's okay. If we pay our own way and serve as self-supporting missionaries, will you just give us permission to go? How many people would do that? And they finally said, okay, I guess if we have to, right? I mean, if we have to. So they go to general conference session. They pray over them. They get down to South America, and they write about this in their journals and in their autobiographical accounts. They finally get down there, and, and it's disastrous. It's kind of like my day been today, you know? I mean, they get there, and, the, and, the, and, 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 and they almost fall into the ocean as they arrive. They think they get actually drenched, and they finally get to shore, and they start taking the train up. And it's their first day, their first night, you know, and they have to stop because it's a two-day train ride. And, and they, they meet some people that were supposed to meet and, and encourage them, right? And they, they visit these church members only to discover that they have, I don't remember what it was, some terrible uh, disease. I don't remember if it's tuberculosis or what it was, but some contagious disease. And, and he's like, okay, I'm not going in there. <laughs> and he goes back to the hotel room. Uh, oh, and I forgot to tell you about supper. Supper, they had the food, and, and as they're getting the food and getting ready to clean up, um, they notice that when everyone's done with the food, they put the dishes on the ground, and they let the guinea pigs clean off the dishes. And they suddenly started to lose their appetite. And, and, and then, okay, so then they come back to the hotel, and the hotel's on fire. It's, it's a pretty hard way. And then the next day, they get to the shores of Lake Titicaca. And Anna turns to Fernando, and they write about this, and they break down in tears. Why, God, did we do this? Have we just been foolish? Has this been our own selfish desires? And they pray the prayer of Jabez. You know that prayer? Please, God, expand, expand your territory here. And with tears in their eyes, 
They go across the lake. They find a place to stay. But it was in that very area of where they were crying that later the first mission station would be established. By the way, do you know how the first mission station was established? It's a crazy story because all the land was owned by these land barons and controlled by the religious authorities there. And none of them wanted Protestant missionaries, definitely not Adventist missionaries, to be there. So everywhere they turned, they kept telling them no. Talk about religious freedom. No religious freedom. And finally, here's that one of these... One of these land barons that owns a bunch of these mines would be coming through. So Fernando Stahl takes his donkey, by the, name, his, the, by the way, his name of, of his donkey became his good friend. His name, the donkey's name was Samson, okay? So Samson and, and, and Fernando Stahl, and they had the guide that was leading them. And he knew to catch this guy, he had to travel all night over the mountains, okay? And, and there starts to be a storm with lightning. And, and eventually it's so dark and so dangerous that their guide says, you know, why don't you go first? <laughs> and at one point he's about to step over the cliff and a flash of lightning stops him and he realizes he's on, on the edge of a precipice and, and he said God spared my life as the morning hours as they're going over the mountains the light starts coming up they see another party that is stopped and they're trying to rescue someone that had gone over the side now he's trained as a nurse he goes to his aid tries to help the man bandages him up and then the next, uh, goes with them down to that next town. They said, where, 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 why are you here? So well, I'm looking for so-and-so. And so, well, I, uh, uh, and, and, and he realizes suddenly, he's, uh, he's, tell me again why you're here? And he starts telling, well, I'm here to meet so-and-so because we want to open up a mission station for these peoples here. We want to help and minister to them and no one will sell us any property. I need to meet with this person. I'm hoping that I can persuade him to buy that land. And he says to him, I am that person. And I am gonna sell you whatever mission property that you want, which turned out to be where they had had that Jabez prayer before. I mean, it's you know, incredible, incredible. And he says, and I'm gonna employ you as my personal physician. And as long as that man was alive, he sent him a check. And he said that check was so generous, it was enough to supply the entire mission. Remember, self-supporting missionary, God made a way. So when people step out in faith, they're activists. They want to do something to make a difference in the world around them. It doesn't matter what that is. The Holy Spirit will work in the most incredible of ways to open doors. One more story I want to tell you about. This time it's from China, from China. If only those, those early Millerites could have imagined the Advent message going to the ends of the earth. Chrysler is one of my all-time favorite people in Adventist history. He worked for Ellen White, a very trusted literary assistant, worked on a number of Ellen White's books. And as a young man, ended up uh, losing his job because Ellen White died. I mean, when the prophet dies, you're working for, you're, you're out of a job. He goes to the next general conference session. A.G. Daniels says, we need missionaries to China. And, and then Chrysler's sitting, and he, and he looks, Daniels looks down at him, I mean, and says, Brother Chrysler, are you willing to go to China? <laughs> he says, yes, sir, I am. And his wife, Minnie, was not so happy with him. She took a year later to catch up with him in China. Uh, wasn't so sure that this was a good idea, but they, they eventually end up going over there, fall in love with the people and the culture and learn the language. Now, I have actually interviewed people in China, especially up in northwest China, where they were missionaries, okay? Uh, when you could, you could do this, okay? Uh, and, and so I have these oral histories and this elderly man, I went and had supper with his family. He's now the head of one of these house churches, I guess you call it. And, and he said, I became a Christian because Chrysler came to my village and he gave us, all of us children, candy. And on the inside of the candy wrapper, in each wrapper, he had written a Bible promise in Chinese. He said, that's how I learned about Jesus. That's how I learned about Jesus. Well, let me tell you the story about what my, one of my favorite stories about Chrysler because in the middle of the wars of the 1920s, uh, the Civil War was so terrible that, that the warring factions that the missionaries had to evacuate, everyone had to evacuate, Christians were being persecuted, they knew they had to leave, and then suddenly they got word, everything is calm now, it's safe to come back. And so to encourage the workers there, Chrysler and others will go to hold some workers' meetings. We call them pastors and teachers meetings now, right? I mean, have all these, these people come together, encourage them after this time of, it had been maybe like two years, I think, two or three years. 
um, that, that all of this chaos had happened. So they were eager to get back in there, find out who was still around, around and, and who, who could come and able to be there. What they didn't know is that when they arrived, it was a trap. It was a trap because those it had been some former members who wanted them to come back so that they could come and kill them. So as each person showed up at the train station, showed up at the mission, they would lead them into the church. And they, were, they noticed around the church were great stacks of firewood. And they were just waiting for everybody to come. And so if you knew you were going to die, you, your face suddenly starts taking a, a little bit more uh, serious turn. And they start earnestly praying together. They start singing together. And as they're having this prayer meeting, one of them remembers in the back of the church is a little ladder leading to the roof. And one by one through the day, they slowly took turns, went up to the rooftop, and they escaped on that rooftop and met outside of the city. And that evening when it was time to burn the church down, they looked inside, nobody was there. He said that before they could come and look for them, a typhoon had blown in. You know, in Asia, we have these typhoons, like hurricanes. And for the next three and a half days, that they were able to meet. No one bothered them because no one was going to go out in the middle of a typhoon. And there they had their workers meeting they wanted to have. And they, he says that they closed that workers meeting with a communion service. They were all sitting in the mud, holding the emblems of Christ's broken body and blood. And they celebrated that communion service and they were ready to go and the storm, the typhoon ended. They all escaped. Not one person was ever caught. God works in mysterious ways. We don't know all the ways the Holy Spirit has worked, in the, but, but we see little, little bits and pieces, like Miller walking down a way as this man remembers these, these two uh, messengers that were stopping the mob from harming him, or, or, or Chrysler there in, in China, or, or uh, Fernando Stahl, all of these incredible stories of God's providence and deliverance, because when God's people fall in love with Jesus, they're activists. Radical things happen. And we can be thankful for their legacy. And who knows what God might do in and through us today. Because God wants to work in our lives the same way that he did with our early pioneers. All right. I, 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 uh, Jennifer said that I could have some time for some questions and answers here. You know, um, uh, this is an opportunity. If you have some questions about Adventist history or about the activism of our pioneers. Um, I feel like I should have an altar call. Maybe I should just pray with you guys, uh, and then we'll have some questions. Is that okay? Is that all right? Let's pray together. Let's pray. Father God, I just, I just want to thank you for the sacrifice and commitment of our pioneers, and, and that as they saw a new picture of you as a loving God in heaven, that as they fell in love with you, that they worked for heaven here on earth. Thank you for that activist legacy that made them want to to change the world around them, make it a better place and impact other people's lives that all kinds of reform societies and and i don't even know all the ways that that it's just i'm learning and discovering new ways but but i know that heritage you want that heritage to live on in and through us help us to be custodians of sharing that message of love and mercy and grace until that great and glorious day when you do come. Help us to walk in the footsteps of those pioneers is my prayer in your name. Amen. All right, some questions. Any questions? Yes, sir. Michael, when we talk about some of our original leaders in the church, it seems like many of them were young. What kind of age were a lot of the leaders when our church was just getting started? Do you have any idea? Uh, yeah, overall, very young. But there was a variety of ages, right? I mean, Joseph Bates, he was an older sea captain, had been retired. But, but by the time you look at, at the founders of, of our church, you know, uh, when, when they established the first printing press, I think they added up all the ages of, of the early church workers, and the average age was something like 17. So there was a youthfulness in, in the founding of our church that certainly... Uh, I think brought some rigor, and, and there's something also about that, 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 that you have a holy boldness, because you, you don't know enough to, to things that can stop you, so you're just like, I'm going to try it anyways, and, and that level of creativity uh, is something that is just really uh, remarkable when you look at the early beginnings of, of Adventism, um, that, that creativity and, and youthfulness 
Um, it, it really, it, it's there. It's there. Yeah. It's, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. How would you describe the activism of our pioneers today? We talk to them about political activism. Mm. But what you're talking about sounds like religious activism about yeah. our specific beliefs. And maybe health activism with Joseph Bates and so on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that that is that is a good uh, a, a good question, and um, our pioneers were very uh, very interested in politics and very uh, very open to uh, what was going on uh, at that time. But but the way that and and um, I thought I was the the one that was using this, but I know several people in Orland even makes like I think socks that say this thing. Um, along this this basic point that that that, that our, our our faith should inform our politics and not our politics informing our faith. Did I do justice to that, Orlin? Pretty good. Pretty good. All right, I, I'm trying. I'm trying. And 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 so uh, there's something about that that uh, um, it, we we can't say that our pioneers were not political because that's just not true. In fact, the more I look, the more I see that they were very involved in politics. But the, it, what. It, Sometimes people cherry pick certain Ellen White quotations to make it seem that we shouldn't ever be involved in, in politics. But my reading of Ellen White of those quotations is that we should not be partisan in our politics. In other words, we shouldn't be loyal to a particular candidate or a party, okay? And I, that's what I see Ellen White warning against. If you're just only self-identifying, they, they saw their identity fluid enough that, that they could stand for their convictions even if that meant uh, changing support for different candidates and parties because it was so important to them the issues at hand and and something that's kind of really radical is Ellen White when it came to the temperance ballot now I think this was in Texas or Oklahoma I'd have to look up I, I don't remember off the top of my head but it was in the southwest okay uh, and and there was a, a, a vote that was going on and they tried to hold it on Sabbath morning uh, so that none of the Sabbath keepers, the Seventh-day Adventists could vote, right? And, and Ellen White surprised them and, and loaded everybody up in wagons to go down to the ballot box to vote about the temperance issue on the, on the ticket at that particular time. So that even meant, if necessary, expressing one's conviction uh, by going down and voting on Sabbath. But I don't think she's just saying, hey, you know, go be political and start going every Sabbath down and, 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 and push for your candidate. But it was a matter of, of deep conviction of conscience. And so we definitely see that. But um, I, I, I think this is where we really struggle, you know, even today that, uh, you know, we, we tend to be very loyal to, to candidates and, and, and parties. And, and, and we allow those things to divide us as a church, and, and that should never happen. And that's definitely not in the spirit of, of our pioneers. You know, um, It's okay to have political convictions, but, but we need to be uh, very charitable and never let um, whatever our personal uh, preferences come between us as brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and uh, you know, I, we could give a whole range of issues that are going on in our culture and society. Culture wars don't change. I mean, it seems like it's fresh to us at the moment, but, but all throughout history, you know, there's been uh, people are dealing with change and contentious issues. Uh, my wife's an early modern historian, so she tells me funny stories about the 15 and 1600s and St. Paul's Cross in London and all the crazy things that, that were happening. And I'm like, oh, that sounds like when I was a pastor. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, any more questions? Yeah, Kathy. Um, you speak of how many young people were involved in this, mm -hmm. and, and also of, of the important role that women uh, played. Yeah. And it doesn't seem like we see so much of that in our church today. That may be an understatement. When do we see that shift away from that? And why do you think that occurs? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Uh, wow, cover cover all of Adventist history tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, I've written a couple books on this, so uh, my goodness, my goodness. So, uh, yeah. So what? Um, you know, Adventism. You know, as historians, we like to say that that history is complex, and that history. Um, 
uh, is, is, you know, when we, we look back, uh, we have to acknowledge the, these kinds of nuances and changes and stuff like that. Um, really, I mean, honestly, the early 20th century after Ellen White's death and the church is confronted with change, um, I would argue fundamentalism. Now, I, I, I always hesitate because then sometimes that word can be used pejoratively, and I just want to say I don't mean that in a pejorative way. I'm a historian, so I'm using it as a strict historical term, a historical movement, although I, I realize some people can use it for different reasons or different definitions. But in the classic sense of fundamentalism being militant defense of the faith and, and, and people were polarizing each other in the early 20th century, and it's about the time right after Ellen White's death. In 1910, um, we went from a church that was very empowering of women. And so we had about a thousand women in leadership as pastors, missionaries, administrators. Um, by 1930, they're basically almost all gone. Um, we also go from a church in the 19th century, and you'll hear this tomorrow about um, how our pioneers were abolitionists, very strongly, ardently abolitionists. You'll hear that tomorrow. By the early 20th century, um, by the 1920s, we go to a church that's largely segregated, uh, segregated to the point that General Conference is segregated, um, segregated to the point that you actually, in the 1920s, I've, I've, I've written an article on this, there were Adventist uh, leaders who were part of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, probably the most uh, startling thing, I mean, you find things in history, some things you don't like. And it's one of those things uh, that someone said to me, why, why do you write about that? Because I, I, I say we have to be honest in our history. Sometimes it means we have to talk about the uncomfortable things we found. So how do we go from an abolitionist church to a segregated church in the 20th century? That's an uncomfortable conversation, just as with empowering women in leadership as pastors to where we basically push them out. And um, I think, I would argue it comes down to bad theology um, and theology that began to push a hierarchy and, and, and it's a long, complex story that I don't have time to go into all those details, but um, theolo extreme theology breeds extreme theology. And that's what I would argue. And so people began to proof text Ellen White to make it sound like she approved of all of these things. And, and so when we take Ellen White out of context and we push extreme theological positions, that, then that can be very problematic in our, in our church. So, uh, but, but that's to say that if we talk about those uncomfortable conversations, I hope we can do it in a constructive way, that, that we can find ways to talk about how can we empower everybody in our church today, regardless of race, regardless of gender. These are ongoing conversations that our church is having, right? And so we need to find uh, winsome and constructive ways. Um, we're, we, we tend to focus on the polarizing things, right? If we can get a sound bite, we live in a world of extremes in politics and our culture today. Can we focus on our mission? Can we focus on our mission and instead of, of, of trying to uh, you know, I'm against you, you're against me because we take different positions on whatever the issue is and say, um, and, and assume the most charitable and best posture towards one another, assuming that even if we disagree, that we're still working for the mission of the church. By the way, one last thought that goes along with that, and this is my pastoral heart here um, when it comes to this, this, this Adventist historian's pastor's heart here. And, and that is, is, as I studied fundamentalism in the 1920s, and I've been writing a lot on this topic for some time, um, I also started reading some of the most fun and amazing mission stories, some that I just shared with you this evening, that I've ever run across. And one of the things I, I think that um, the devil wants nothing more than to distract us from our mission. That, that's, really, that's really it, right? Uh, and so if we can focus on those stories of God's leading and, and instead of criticizing one another or criticizing a certain leader in the church or whatever, um, really just pray for them and lift them up. And, and so, uh, and I would say, I hope that we can also learn from that history, you know, um, we, we, to do the very best we can to be honest about the past, uh, but then to do so in a way that is, is hopefully winsome, create conversations in our church today. Uh, these are very, very relevant topics that, um, uh, continue to be debated. Um, and if we do debate those things, again, um, let's not do it in a way that, that um, where we polarize each other. Let's do it so that we always are coming back to the mission of why we're here and we fall in love with Jesus again and again, like Miller did, like these other pioneers did, uh, so that, that we're willing to take risks, 
um, to, to do whatever it takes to continue um, uh, to tell, telling Jesus with others. By the way, let me just give you a, kind of a, a, hopefully a more neutral kind of example in our world today. Um, one of my wife's doctoral professors, Philip Jenkins, he, he wrote a book on climate catastrophe and faith. He argues that one of the, um, the church of the future, according to all the research, is gonna be the church that addresses the issue of environment. The issue of environment. And I thought to myself as I read that book, what if there is a group of people at the very end of time, when the, as I started out my talk tonight about all the things in the earth that's going crazy and wonders in the heavens, if they're seeing the environment change around them, that maybe that will bring people back to search the scriptures once again. And if maybe, you know, in Revelation, he ends his book, he ends with Revelation 20. At the very end, it says, there shall be see no more. Why would Jesus put that through John the Revelator at the very end for God's people at the very end of time, unless rising sea levels were a major issue for the world right before Jesus comes? And so I leave that with you to ponder as we think about our activist roots that our church leaders founded. They're addressing pertinent issues in their world and society at that time. What if God's calling us to be activists to care for as stewards of the creation. After all, we believe in the Sabbath. We believe in God's creation. This is a part of our theological DNA. And what if God gave us that unique theology that we have as understanding the Sabbath and that relationship with our creator and our redeemer at the very end of time to address issues of creation care at the very end of Earth's history. Now, those people who care about the earth and taking care of the earth, they're not doing it because they believe they can save the earth. In fact, it's a paradox, once again, that the earth is going to be destroyed. It's going to burn. But, but because we believe we're going to a heavenly city, that means that we have to start caring as custodians and stewards of God's creation now. It's amazing that some of the top scholars, historians in the world today are looking and addressing that issue, saying the church of the future is gonna be the church that addresses the issue of climate change. What if God gave us a message that was just as relevant for us today as it was for our pioneers? Yeah. 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 Marcel. I think the word, I think the word would be more urgency. Okay. It would be urgency because you read about, for example, um, Himes, who's this creative genius, you know, kind of thing, right next to William Miller, publishing all this stuff, and he talks about, let's do a camp meeting if time lasts. And he says we should actually be so bold as to have a great effort in the far off wild lands of Ohio, around Cleveland and Cincinnati. That's the farthest west they could think of at the time, right? And, and, and that was pretty bold and radical. And you know what, they, they actually go, they said, if time will last. And so for them, the idea of activism, let's do something because it's urgent, uh, because we don't have a moment of time to lose. Now God's been very gracious to us uh, in allowing time to last, that's, that's one of the questions, the quandaries of Adventism. Time has lasted as long as it has. But it is also interesting to me in Revelation 14 that God's people at the very end of time are described as having the patience of the saints. Here's the patience of the saints. So whatever time we have, God calls us to be patient, but not passive, but active in our patient, working for uh, the kingdom of God. And uh, in fact, I'm writing right now, I have a book coming out from Erdman's. It's a history of the Seventh-day Adventist church. And, and I titled it um, initially, my working title was The Patience of the Saints. And then finally, um, I decided to, to reword that and, and title it The Impatience of the Saints. <laughs> the Impatience of the Saints. So um, that's kind of fun. That's kind of fun. Um, but, but there's a sense of urgency. Yeah. Yes, sir. I know that there's uh, a lot of good information in the encyclopedia of Seventh-day Adventists, but where else would you look for these history stories and things of our early pioneers? 
Yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, the, they're all over the place. There's a, a, you know, what I'm excited about is there's a, a, a new generation of Adventist historians. Dr. Bird is definitely one of them. Uh, we're working on a, a series of uh, presentations for the American Society of Church History, and and uh, it's kind of weird because I had a couple of the younger ones come to me and say, you know, you're the you're the you're the you're the old historian now, and I'm like, no. <laughs> 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 And, uh, but I'm excited that we have, um, you know, I would say 15 very promising, very, and, and you're seeing them write articles, you're seeing them uh, publishing, you watch, keep watching for more books and things like that to come off from our presses and, and different publications. Um, I, I give a shameless plug for the archive statistics and research at the North American Division. Follow us on social media. Follow us on social media, because then when we have great discoveries of new documents and stories, we like to post it on there. Whoever has written about it, so you can find us on, on social media. Just, just Google that long-term North, you know, archive statistics research North American Division. You'll, you'll find us. I should have put a little thing up there, but I, I didn't. Um, but, but yeah, so social media provides new uh, opportunities to share uh, those stories and trying to do it in, in ways that help um, I believe our, our history has a very meaningful purpose to help us understand our identity and to encourage us to walk in the footsteps of those pioneers to urge us to urgency, that, that Jesus is coming and we do have a work to do. And, uh, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of material out there um, and uh, the Encyclopedia of Seventh-day Adventism, that's a great resource. I think there's 6,030 articles as of yesterday. Um, keep, keep watching for those articles. There might be some people in this room that needs to write articles. In fact, I think there's some people in this room that I'm gonna try not to look at. They're supposed to write articles for me, for the encyclopedia. See, uh, so, so there's a lot of, of great and creative work that's happening, and, uh, but online we've got resources, and watch for more books and articles. Um, there, there's a lot of great stuff. Denis Forten just came out with a new biography of, of G.I. Butler that uh, just was released, I think, two weeks ago. Uh, read that. I mean, is, uh, here's one of our Adventist historians who's done um, this incredible research for the last, I don't know, four years. And um, so look for those things and support them. And, and, uh, um, and, and oh, oh, one more thing. One more thing. Podcasts. How could I forget? Yeah. We have a thing called the Adventist History Podcast. If you like Adventist history, check it out. My friend Matthew Lucio young pastor in Peoria, Illinois, has one of the best podcasts. It's actually one of the top Adventist podcasts in the world right now. In fact, there's people that have been baptized from listening to a podcast on Adventist history. Isn't that amazing? And, and just a winsome way of telling Adventist history. And there's some other historian, Michael Campbell and Greg Howell, they do one called Adventist Pilgrimage. And that's a deep dive on new discoveries in Adventist history of, of documents and all kinds of things, so check, check out those podcasts. That's a shameless uh, self-promotion, I'm sorry. But, um, but yeah, some great podcasts. Um, oh, oh, one more. My wife just spent the last year, and it's gonna launch this summer, a podcast on women in Adventist history called They Also Serve. So go to your iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts, Spotify, They Also Serve, and there's a preview episode of their first episode. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, to see women telling stories about women in Adventist history. It's, it's really, oh my, it's, it's something else. I don't know who's next. You're going to have to fight it out here. Yeah, in the back. We'll let the gentleman in the back. Yeah. The, uh, you want to say a word to your Oxford uh, Press project? Oh yeah, I forgot about that. Um, that was only like the last seven years of my life. Uh, yeah, so, so, um, so something really crazy, you go to these scholarly meetings, so the top historians in the world that, uh, that meet together and like to really duke it out, really hash it out, and some of them can, can really hash it. Um, and so we've been trying to um, do paper sessions where we get Adventist historians presenting research on Adventist history. It's really cool. And people come to us and say, we didn't know about Ellen White before, but she sounds really cool. Like, like this is amazing, right? So I was giving a, a paper, and we had a pa one of these paper sessions about seven years ago, and the head book editor of Oxford was there. And uh, afterwards, we were uh, visiting together, and uh, the conversation came, turned to the Oxford handbook. He said, you know, I'd be willing to, to see a proposal from you. Uh, of an Oxford handbook on Seventh-day Adventism. Well, there's one for the Anglicans, the Lutherans, and the Methodists, and a whole bunch of other traditions. And so I sent him a proposal, 
He wrote back and said, that's not, that's not really our style. You're more of a Cambridge kind of guy. And, and so I, I wrote back, I wrote back, because I'm praying about this too, because I think, you know, this could be an incredible witness too, to, to tell our theology and our history, right? And, and so, um, so I said, could you give me some suggestions? Say, well, if you're open to suggestions, I can work with you. Absolutely. And it, you know what his first suggestion was? For an Oxford handbook of Seventh-day Adventism, for a church that's founded by a woman, you don't have a lot of women writers writing for your book. That kind of stung a little bit. And so I had to kind of work on getting more women. I didn't try to not to, you know, but, but anyway. So we, we got more women involved in the project like we should have. And um, now seven years later, uh, it's coming out in the next uh, couple weeks. So I'm really excited about that. So um, basically about 40 chapters covering Advent, the wide range of Adventist theology, Adventist history uh, by a select group of Adventist and non-Adventist scholars. And this is the first major reference work about Seventh-day Adventism by a major university or academic press. And so I'm really excited about it. Great team, great contributors. And uh, so that's coming out. Um, I think my, uh, the, the printer said it's going to be out in the next two, three weeks. So we'll see. Yeah. The Oxford Handbook of Seventh-day Adventism. Yeah, so I'm hoping and praying that, that that will be in every major university library in the world, pretty much. And so this will be an opportunity for people, if they have questions, what do Adventists believe, that they can, they will have a reference work that they can refer to, hopefully. Um, and I'm, I'm very proud of it. Every, every article has been peer-reviewed like 25 times.